Now, how, how are your dinner conversations? I mean, <laughs> um, it must be very fascinating. You talk a lot about the cases that you can talk about, obviously. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to have a, you know, a chief justice of a high court, a retired judge, and then you've got, you know, two lawyers. Well, um, uh, somebody once asked me about conversations between my wife and myself, and uh, she was on the district court, and there were a lot of criminal cases there. Right. And uh, my answer to those questions was, well, she would give me a blow-by-blow -blow account of her cases, and when I started talking about mine, her eyes would acquire a distant look. And <laughs> so uh, uh, there are lots of things to talk about other than the cases and the right. law. Sometimes we do, but... Uh, there's also, as in any good marriage, a lot of talk about nothing. <laughs> that's, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's, yeah. You're absolutely right. And that's good, good counsel, right? <laughs> Indeed. Um, you know, I read some of the articles that you've, you've written, and um, you're very passionate about issues <coughs> relating to the rights of Australia's indigenous people, which is what you call the Aboriginal law. Mm, that's right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your work with regards to being an advocate for Aboriginal um, Indigenous Australians? Well, the advocacy work, I suppose, would have happened really when I was a uh, young practitioner. Right. In fact, while I was still an article clerk, uh, I got involved with um, an organisation called A New Era for Aboriginals, which was mm -hmm. set up by some, some women in Perth. Uh, and uh, uh, I started up a justice committee and uh, with other young lawyers, uh, right. law graduates, uh, we were looking at you know, making representations to government about Aborigines in the justice system right. because they were usually unrepresented and right. hopelessly overrepresented in our prisons. Right. Um, and uh, to cut a long story short, that justice committee evolved into the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia, which became a, a very significant provider of legal representation right throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And it was funded seriously by the uh, federal federal government. Right. And some leading lawyers of the day um, uh, worked, uh, gave their services for a year at a time, going to remote centres like Port Hedland to provide representation, probably for the first time in history, wow. for Aboriginal people in those areas. One of those lawyers was a friend, uh, John Tui, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, went up there for a year with his wife and their six children and represented Aboriginal people up there. Uh, he later became the first Aboriginal Lands Commissioner under uh, the first land rights legislation in Australia mm -hmm. and later became a judge of the High Court. And he was a member of the High Court that decided the uh, historic Mabo case in which customary uh, native title was recognised by the common law in 1992. Right, right, right. And through that, um, the Aborigines were given the rights? They were Their, their, their traditional law and custom and the... Um, relationship to their country that's mm. embedded in that traditional law and custom was able to be recognised by the non-Indigenous law, if you like, the common right. law, right. and then able to be protected under the common law and under statutes which, uh, for example, prevented discrimination in relation to property rights between right. uh, people of different races. Right. So the, the main issue on that one would probably be the main property rights, property ownership for the Aboriginal. Absolutely, right. yes. And, and it's a... It, it's not an easy process, uh, the nature, and the nature of the property right is not like um, a property right held by an individual, it's a communal right, so it can't right. be bought or sold. Right. But the communities uh, that hold native title are able to make agreements with people who want to do things on their country. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, where big mining projects are concerned, there have been a lot of agreements made and under which, with the permission of the community and subject to protections for areas of particular significance, a project can be undertaken. And uh, the quid pro quo is um, employment programs for young Aborigines, mm -hmm. a compensation flow into right. trust funds for the benefit of the community right. and a whole raft of related measures. Right, right, right. Fascinating. What, what percentage of Australia is made up of, um, I suppose, the Aborigines that you're talking well, about? Well, I suppose that would depend on how you count, but um, um, I think we've probably got about 400,000 uh, Aboriginal people around the country. Right. Uh, we've got a total population of 21 to 22 million. Wow, right. right so right. we're about the size of New York State, population-wise. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting when you talk about size, the size of the country is absolutely immense. Mm -hmm. And as a federal judge, I had to make a determination recognising customary native title in part of Western Australia, which is my home state. And that, that had all been agreed. It was a negotiated settlement. 
but the area of land over which I was recognising native title was the size of Belgium. Oh, and there wow. are only a few hundred people in it, the Bantu people. That's huge. And uh, there was no song and dance about it. It wasn't a yeah. great drama because right. there was very little resource pressure out there. And of course, from the people's point of view, they got the, um, the recognition of their traditional mm -hmm. association and the protection that went with it. Right, which are very important. Absolutely. Mm. Right, right. Um, is there a limit to being a Chief Justice? Well, there's a limit to being uh, any, any federal judge uh, in Australia under our constitution has to retire at age 70. Okay. They used to be uh, lifetime appointments, but our constitution was amended back in the 1980s to change that to a cutoff of 70. And uh, we've had very few amendments to our constitution, only eight in its yeah. whole history. Wow. There have been 47 attempts to amend it, but only eight have got up, and that was one that got up, which maybe says something about right. <laughs> what people think of judges who are too old. Right, right, right. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, I mean, you probably have, what, 30 more years, right, Justice? Yeah, that's so nice of you, yes. I've got seven. <laughs> you look very young, but um, how does, um, do you hear criminal and civil matters? Oh, yes. We, um, the, the court is the final court of appeal in both crime and, uh, and civil matters. So the, the whole range of okay. uh, legal issues across the country can be dealt with in the High Court. Okay, great. Do you have any special duties that you do as Chief Justice? And the High Court? Well, it's a, it's a peculiar thing. You'll find the position of Chief Justice mentioned in our Constitution and mentioned in uh, the Act which sets up the High Court, but the Chief Justice isn't given any particular statutory powers. Mm -hmm. The management of the High Court is vested in all seven of the Justices, okay. and when it comes to decision-making uh, in cases, then my vote is you know, just one vote amongst the seven. Right. Um, of course, as the Chief Justice, I preside on the hearing of the appeals where I'm sitting and uh, I chair meetings of the judges that occur afterwards when we're discussing what may happen in the case. Uh, and uh, when we've had our conference, I might suggest that uh, if we're reaching what looks like a consensus, I might suggest that one or other of the judges uh, might like to produce a first draft and then we'll, we'll have a look at that. It's not as prescriptive, I think, as in the US system where there's a, a formal designation by the Chief Justice. It's more a matter of consent and my identifying somebody both in terms of uh, you know, spread of workload and in terms of their um, interest in and uh, work on the topic to do the draft. Right, right. And the way it happens then is somebody circulates a draft and then another judge might say, I agree. And then the judge who's done the draft will ring up the judge who agrees and say, would you like to join? So it becomes a joint judgment. And you get a, if you get a succession of agreements, it'll become a total joint judgment of all judges. Right, right, right. Is it um, more common that you would have a consensus judgment, all of you, you know? It's been a complaint uh, yeah. over the years that we've done too many separate judgments and that it's yeah. been hard for people to work out really what the ratio of the decision is. But in recent years, that's changed. Um, last year, we had about 53 judgments, and I think 24 or 25 of those judgments were single, unanimous, joint judgments. Uh, we don't have the practice, as uh, you have here, of uh, a judge who writes the judgment of the court and is identified as the judge doing the right, judgment of the court. Right. When it's a joint judgment, you don't know who the author is. You might be able to guess from its style. But right, 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 right. Um, are uh, the justices also allowed to do a dissenting opinion? Of course. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You couldn't stop them. <laughs> it's true. That's true. As much as, you know, they try, uh, right? And, uh, you know, sometimes we might have on an important case where it's a line, a line ball sort of call, you might have four judges in majority and three judges in dissent. Yeah. And sometimes the, the hardest cases from the practitioner's point of view is where the majority um, is not quite unanimous on the principle. Um, so that's why we prefer joint majority judgments if we can achieve them, or at least making sure that we're all as closely aligned as possible, subject to you know, everybody's independence and right. integrity and everything else. Right, right, right. Now, it's, it's interesting. Um, you indicated that, you know, your... your um your court actually has several women um, justices in there. What's the makeup? You have seven and... We have seven uh, justices um, and four are men and three are women. It's actually very good. 